Let me pray and then we'll start. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you for Timmy that came this far distance. Pray a blessing upon him and his work here. And to the end, that the truth of the Jesuits might be circulated even more. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I know your background. Uh, you started with JFK. Right. Um, with that tugging at your heart when you were a young boy. Right. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Okay, um, <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was raised in an Irish Catholic uh, development called Terra Hills. And uh, the land was sold by an Irish Catholic lady to a developer whose provision for sale was that every street would be named after or with an Irish name. So there was Kilkenny and there was Cornelius and there was Shannon and there was Kevin and Flannery. Well, I grew up on Limerick Road, <laughs> 2700 Limerick Road in uh, Terra Hills. And the first, uh, uh, actually I was, my first school I went to was Pullman in Richmond, but it was an all black school. So my parents moved all to a white neighborhood, which white Catholic neighborhood, which was um, Terra Hills there. And uh, there uh, I went from first grade to sixth grade. So when I was in fourth grade, my teacher was, her name was Miss Beals, and I was desperately in love with her. Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, she came in the classroom crying one day and uh, t terribly disturbed me. What could make her cry? You know? And she said, the president's been shot. And uh, so there was an announcement and, and that was a very uh, traumatic experience for me at that time. So I went home and then my mother told me the same thing. She was crying too and so I, we went through the whole thing. I was playing um, I was playing in a group at 10 years old, playing lead guitar, and we had a practice that evening, and you know, the bass player, we were at his house, and we watched uh, what happened, and then about a week later, or several days later, we watched the funeral. And uh, so, it, it affected me, it, it disrupted my life, it, it was an emotional trauma, and so I determined that someday I would find who did this, on and off. I can remember Lyndon Johnson on Air Force One being sworn in on that Roman Catholic missile, um, Sarah Brady there, and his, he looked guilty, he had guilt written all over his face, and I could see Jackie there, she was obviously grieving, and she was obviously to me as 10 years old holding something in that she knew she couldn't say what she wanted to say. So um, I knew that there was something terribly wrong in, in Denmark here. And so um, off and on over the years, um, especially when I was in Bible college, when I was in um, um, Baptist Bible College in Clark Summit, I met an Italian believer who knew quite a bit about the Mafia. We talked about the Mafia being involved in the Kennedy assassination. And um, after talking with him, I was utterly convinced he was right, but that it had to be more than the mafia. It had to be government. And then with JFK coming out, that classic line that I quote in my book, uh, you know, could the mafia change the parade route? Um, could the mafia get Oswald in, in and out of Russia? I mean, could the mafia uh, make a mess of the investigation? I mean, all these questions that were so very well put together by Oliver Stone and the writers, you know, lead you to the conclusion that it was a government inside job and that they have a party line to continue to cover it up. And then when you read Fletcher Prouty's work, JFK, and uh, The Secret Team, he further solidifies that conclusion because he was the liaison between what the CIA and the Pentagon. So, as a, at a young age, I was very affected by it, and I was raised atheist. I came from an apostate Protestant family. My mother was, her, her mother was a Lutheran and a Swede. She was an Anderson. And uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, was an, was an Irish Protestant, 
unsaved, never read, read a passage of scripture to me in my life. <laughs> uh, couldn't stand the Roman Catholics. I remember he asked me one time, do you have a girlfriend? I said, well, yes, I do. She Catholic or Protestant? Well, I couldn't care less. I said, well, she's Catholic. He went, I said, well, she's very nice to me, and she's just, her mother's were great, and her father's nice, her father's an electrician, and we're sharing Christian. So, you know, I was raised on his part, when I would see him periodically, with an anti-Catholic bias, but I never knew why. So I thought he was just a bigot. And then I found out years later that my grandfather was in the Ku Klux Klan. Because my mother put on his hood one day in Wisconsin. He had a... Uh, is this too much? Should I not go in? One day, okay, is, uh, he, had, he had a hood, or she, she had a, his hood on, and she was running around outside, and my grandmother ran in, Ethel, get in here! And so she was threatened with a whipping for running around with my grandfather's Ku Klux Klan. And this was... she was, Well, for fun. Just for fun. Just for fun. Just scare the kids? Or? Yeah, I don't know why she did it. She just thought it'd be a plaything, put the hood on, and, <laughs> yeah. and run around. Well, this was in uh, Wisconsin. This is not in the South. Because remember, the clan in the North is just as much, if not more, powerful than the clan in the South. Indiana, those places like that. So, <clears throat> he was also an orangeman. He painted his garage door orange of his auto shop. Because he was in auto repair and he was a mechanic in the area, in Beloit, Wisconsin. And so, he was in the clan, he was an orangeman. And he couldn't stand Roman Catholics. And the blacks, for that matter, now that I remember. I remember we were trolling one day in Folsom Lake, and there was a white guy fishing with a black guy, and he said, I don't know why these white guys have to hang around these blacks. And I didn't know what he meant by that, because I was pretty much raised around blacks. You know. So, that was my maternal grandfather. He was, a, he was a very good man to me. He loved me dearly. I was like his son. He always wanted to have a son, and uh, then on my paternal grandparents' part, they were communists, and uh, they they hated Nixon. They called Nixon Hitler, from Nixon to Hitler. Uh, my grandmother, who was a very intelligent woman, considered the Battle of Stalingrad a great, mighty battle, vindicating communism, uh, not knowing that all the military hardware given to Stalin was from Lend Lease. Uh, Eleven point three billion dollars worth from from night from skull and bonesman Averill Harriman on orders of thirty third degree Freemason FDR on orders from Knight of Malta and secret advisor Jesuit Edmund Walsh. So the Jesuits were using FDR and Harry Hopkins to build the Soviet Union at the time, and that made it possible for them to make their stand at Stalingrad. So. Um, my grandmother did not understand that, and I remember telling her one time, this is all, when I, when I was 18 or so, before I went to the Air Force, I said, this is all the Vatican. She said, oh, Eric, you're out to sea in a rowboat. <laughs> and my father had been raised with the anti-communist bias. He told me, you know, anti-communism, he said, communism, you know, is a religion. And I said, you know, you've got a point there. And then Richard Wormbrand later came out with his book, uh, uh, what is it, Marx and Satan? And he goes into the very same scenario that communism is in fact a religion, and what I add is it's identical to Romanism. Its tenets are identical. So, um, in any event, that was my grandparent, my paternal grandparents, they were communists, and my paternal grandfather was a blacksmith. And he used to have a cup of coffee and a cigarette every morning until he got emphysema, and he had to have one of his lungs removed, and I remember he couldn't hardly walk up a set of stairs. So grandma was the boss, it was a matriarchal family, where my maternal grandparents, grandpa was the boss. So two stark different contrasts, um, and, but both were patriotic, both loved their country, and I was instilled with a, a great patriotism and true nationalism by my father. So when this happened to JFK, it deeply affected me, which was the basis for future study.
In that statement, he was on the right side. Okay. I agree with every word that he says there. I do too. Every word. But you said in this statement. In that statement. For example, okay, we have to look at Jefferson a little bit more here. Um, Jefferson could never have been the representative of the Virginian people had he had any other views than those. Because the Virginian people were white, they were Protestant, and they were Baptist. And those white Baptist Protestants, all of them Calvinists for the most part, would never have sent Jefferson to the Continental Congress or the Constitutional Convention had he advocated anything other than that. So the Jefferson is an example of God using an ungodly man for good purposes, and we can never forget that. When God's people obey him and do the right thing, he will, the Lord will divide the camp of the devil and he will use certain of the devil's servants for the benefit of his people. And Jefferson is an example of that. Franklin is another example of that. Uh, Thomas Paine is another example of that. So, <clears throat> Jefferson, um, as you know, was a deist, but he was also involved with the Grand Orient Lodge of France, which was Jacobin. And the Grand Orient Lodge of Paris, France, was completely controlled by the Jesuits. It had become illuminized. And we must always keep our distinction between Freemasonry, low-level American Freemasonry at that time, and illuminized Freemasonry. Okay. Explain that. Okay. <clears throat> Freemasonry was formally revived in 1717 in England. England became the Grandmother Lodge. Um, it is a fact that the purpose for the formal revival of Freemasonry was to restore the Roman Catholic Stuarts to the throne of England because they had been driven out in 1688, the Glorious Revolution of 1688, William and Mary come take the throne in 1689, set forth the Bill of Rights, of which comes our Bill of Rights, from which comes that. And so the Jesuits were foiled at the Battle of the Boyne in 1690 when uh, William III fought with the armies of Louis XIV and King James II. And Louis XIV and King James II were absolute and total Jesuits in their heart, souls, and kingship. They even called themselves Jesuits. And Louis XIV had, I believe, nearly a 60-year reign in France. He began his reign, I think, at the age of 14. And Hollywood depicts him as a great king in one of DiCaprio's movies, uh, The Man Behind the Mask. It goes on to say Louis XIV became one of the greatest kings of France. He was a vicious, adulterous, murderous traitor, killed out the Huguenots, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 drove them out, totally destroyed the, really the productive capacity of France. He destroyed the best of his population. Louis XIV was wicked. And so the Jesuits, in using, uh, using Freemasonry, they revived it in England in 1717 for the purpose of using certain Protestant rulers and leaders to bring them into the Masonic Lodge, camouflaged as something virtuous, and, uh, but unbeknownst to many of them, it would be used as an engine for papal restoration in England. Well, in 1754, the Jesuits at their College of Clermont in Paris, France, wrote the first 25 degrees of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. And I have that quoted in my book. I have the source. It's in a Masonic quiz book. Ask me another brother, written by the Masons. <laughs> so. The Jesuits were the authors of the first 25 degrees of the Scottish Rite, and even Madame Blavatsky will tell you in Isis Unveiled that the Jesuits are the true authors of every rite of Freemasonry. And she would know because she was a Jesuitess and a co-Mason. So <clears throat> we have the revival of Freemasonry in 1717 and the Jesuits seeking to use it as an engine for papal restoration, but what happens is um, God sends a, the first Great Awakening in the 1735-1740 era with the preaching of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. 
and shortly thereafter you have the first great Masonic schism in about 1750 and this divides the Masonic Lodge from the Continental to the English and the English Masons and the American Freemasons ceased to be a an engine of conspiracy for the Jesuits because it broke away this is why to a certain degree I support Leo Zagami if he wants to have a Masonic schism I say praise God and let's get it on divide the Masonic camp so even though he may still be working for high-level Freemasonry maybe even he's a Jesuit agent I don't know but I'm for him causing Masonic schism because if it wasn't for the Masonic schism they wouldn't have had the, you would have not had the suppression of the Jesuits in 1773 by the Pope or their expulsion from Portugal Spain and France all done by French by Freemasons of those countries so I advocate a Masonic schism and so at the time of the Revolutionary War when it started in 1775 we're in the midst we had a great awakening the great awakening caused a great nationalism to arise the result of the Great Awakening was our armies were filled by white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Presbyterians and Baptists to fight this war of tyranny against King George III and George was a, a total tool of the Jesuit order. King George III took in the Jesuits when they were suppressed and kicked out of all the Roman Catholic countries in Europe. When the Pope suppressed them in 1773, uh, King George takes them in after one of his ministers had a secret council with Jesuit General Ritchie. So England becomes the dumping ground of all the European Jesuits. And so they then implement their tyrannical, uh, their Council of Trent in attempting to destroy Protestantism in the colonies by afflicting the colonists. Uh, the Navigation Acts and so on, you can only use English shippers. Under Cromwell, uh, the colonies could use any shippers they wanted. We had true freedom of commerce under Cromwell as when we had colonies. Well, not with King George III, you can only use English shippers. And they jacked the price up and made it impossible to make a profit, just like they're doing to us now. No matter what you do in your business enterprise, you cannot make a profit now. And so they were doing the same thing to the colonists. Well, the English Freemasons and the American Freemasons were working together. They were anti-King George III, anti-Pope. And uh, so they were involved in the Boston Tea Party and involved in some of the great movements that led to the American Revolution. But the Revolution was Protestant. It was based upon Protestant principles. It was carried out by a white Protestant population. There were three million people in the colonies, only 30,000 Roman Catholics and 24 priests. The rest were all white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. We had, I think, 500,000 black slaves at the time. I think that's what Blake says in his history of slavery and the slave trade that was written in 1860. But the white population was Protestant. And we were driven here by the inquisitions of Europe. Every city in Europe had an auto de fe. It had a fire burning heretics regularly on a daily basis. And so we fled after 200 years of persecution. And God gave us this place. That's why Squanto was on the shore when the pilgrims arrived and he speaks English. And he helps them and he saves their very lives. Because God was, uh, was saving his church, a remnant of his church, giving them a place to worship him according to his word, the Bible, the Reformation Bible, the AV 1611 and the Geneva Bible, which came essentially from the same underlying Greek text. The Reformation Bible, which we call it. So <clears throat> we have the English and the American Freemasons separated from Grand Orient Freemasonry on the continent, which includes not only the Grand Orient Lodge of Paris, it's going to include Frederick the Great. Because Frederick the Great is a protector of the Jesuits. Prussia and Russia protect the Jesuits. Russia is Orthodox, Frederick is Lutheran, and Fre Frederick is the foremost Freemason on the continent. He protects them. And during this time of protection, he writes with Jesuit advisors the last eight degrees of high-level Scottish Rite Freemasonry, including the establishment of the Council of the 33rd Degree. But we have to remember that at the time of the American Revolution, the population was Protestant, it was Bible-believing, it had gone through a revival with the First Great Awakening, with the preaching of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, that preached all up and down the eastern seaboard. It had, um, there was a Masonic schism, 
and the Jesuits had been suppressed by the Pope. The order did not legally exist. So all these wonderful characteristics were in place at the time our revolution happened, and then God was involved in the revolution. And if you care to read uh, The Chaplains and Clergy of the Revolution by J.T. Headley, that was written, I believe, in 1868, he gives incident after incident after incident of divine intervention in the saving of Washington's army, his ragtag army. And then because the French had <clears throat> suppressed the Jesuits, Louis XV had kicked them out at the instigation of Madame de Pompadour, his concubine. See, there's God using a wicked man for a good thing. Mm -hmm. So he kicks out the Jesuits out of France. Well, Damons was an assassin sent to kill him. He fails, and Damons is publicly executed. Um, but uh, when Louis XVI comes to power, he still has the expulsion of the Jesuits in place. And it's under Louis XVI that um, uh, Marquis de Lafayette uh, comes over here and helps Washington. And Marquis de Lafayette was called the boy general. Uh, he, was a, he was a son to Washington. They, according to Headley in his life of Washington, um, his son uh, sometimes would sleep with Washington, but it was nothing sexual, all right? He had, had, uh, Lafayette loved his father, George Washington. If Washington was old enough to be his father, and when uh, Lafayette became a father himself, he names his son George Washington Lafayette. So Lafayette is, was, was a Mason, a low-level Mason. He hated the Jesuits, and it was Lafayette said that if the liberties of this country are ever destroyed, it will be by the design of the Jesuit priests. I have that in my book. So Lafayette couldn't stand them. Washington knew all about them. And so God used this schism in Freemasonry to unite a Roman Catholic noble named Lafayette with Washington, the Episcopalian, who later was a Baptist because he was baptized by his captain, one of his captains who was a Baptist pastor, John Gano, in the Hudson River. And there's a man, a historian, that's devoted most of his life to validating and proving the point, and he is quoted in William Grady's uh, how Satan Turned America Against God, his volume one. So, in fact, uh, Washington gave Pastor Gano his sword. And I have the picture of it in my book. But Washington was a Bible-believing Baptist Calvinist. He was surrounded with preachers. Timothy Dwight was one of them, and several others, and they're all listed in the Chaplains and Clergy of the Revolution. So, the heart and soul of the successful American Revolution was really Virginia, and Virginian Calvinists. So this was, uh, this was George Washington's was a schism in Freemasonry. If we are ever to get our liberty, liberty back again in this country, or if we are ever to secede, because, because I advocate Pennsylvania secede, there must be a schism in Freemasonry. And therefore our mode of attack is to show today that Masonry is completely united and it is nothing but an engine of destruction for all national sovereignties by the Jesuit order. In 1868, our country was changed from a Calvinist Republic to a Jesuit Empire. In 1787, when the Constitution was ratified, we can say that's the beginning of our, of our nation as a confederate republic or a federal republic of sovereign nation states. Every state, all 13 states, were nations. According to the Dred Scott decision, every colony became free, independent, and sovereign. So they were all nations. And therefore, as sovereign nations, they had, if they wanted to enter into an alliance, they had to form a confederation. To form a confederation for a more perfect union, because the first union was a confederation of sovereign states. In fact, it's called the Articles of Confederation. So the Constitution, to form a more perfect confederation, which is also called a union, 
It was gathered together, and we have the Constitutional Convention. It's finalized in, what, 90 days? And in 1787, uh, what is it, eight of the 13 colonies ratify, eight of the 13 states ratify, eight of the 13 nations ratify, and a more perfect union or a more perfect confederation is created at that time. They're still free, they're still independent, and they are still sovereign, and they still have the right to secede if their state, if their nation, comes under threat of having its rights and its sovereignty overturned by the limited small central government that it had established. To further this point, <clears throat> the foremost documents that prove that this was a limited Confederate Republic are the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions of 1799. The Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions of 1799 were written by James Madison, a Baptist Calvinist who was not a Mason, and Thomas Jefferson who was an a Deist and a Freemason, and probably in alliance with the Jesuits because he spoke well of Adam Weishaupt. He was an Illuminized Freemason, however, he still advocated right principles. Again, God using an ungodly man for a good purpose. So, they declared in those documents that the Constitution established a federal union of sovereign states and, and to the Constitution, to the federal government, were bequeathed, were delegated certain and specific powers. There were no implied powers in the Constitution. That was the intent of the lawmakers and that is how it should be read because the intent of the lawmakers is the law. And therefore, all this judicial activism we see on the bench today, they're overthrowing the intent of the lawmakers. They have no right to do it. It's a criminal act on the part of these federal judges. So, Dershowitz is one of them, Alan Dershowitz. Dershowitz. So, uh, even though he's not a federal judge, he says the, con the intent of the lawmakers means nothing. Well, this is the typical socialist, communist, neo-Nazi, fascist position of all your federal district judges. They don't care what the intent of the lawmakers is. And this is a crime. This is a reason to secede. The Virginia Kentucky Resolutions, the it was a limited federal republic where certain specific limited powers were granted to Washington. And apart from those specifically named in the Constitution, it has no power. And so we lived under a wonderful government from 1787 to 1868, or really at least in law, because the presidents couldn't go beyond their bounds. Uh, I like that, right? And it's still, it, yeah, right, right. <laughs> it should be, but unfortunately, we know what the problem is. The problem is that in 1868, the Fourteenth Amendment was passed, and the killer section of that amendment is Section 1. And in Section 1, it says that uh, all persons born in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States first, and of the state wherein they reside secondly. So what the Fourteenth Amendment did is it reversed the origin and character of American citizenship, making U.S. citizenship, quote, paramount and dominant, and state citizenship subordinate and derivative. What that did was, it completely changed our form of government. It com because it completely changed the citizenship.
And then in 1872, 73, with the Slaughterhouse Cases, which is a holding case for the Supreme Court, those, those Supreme Court justices held that <clears throat> the privileges and immunities of Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution did not, of U.S. citizenship, did not include the Bill of Rights. And this is exactly, this conspiracy of overthrowing our Bill of Rights was spoken of by Samuel Morse in his great work, Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States, that he wrote in 1835. That the Pope was out here sending his agents, his Jesuits, the Loophole Foundation, to overthrow the liberties of the people of the United States. And that's how they did it. The open attack was, oh, the South is behind the Confederacy, and the Confederacy is going to overthrow the country, and then the Confederacy will make America Catholic. That was the open but false policy. The Confederacy was too Protestant. The secret policy was the Vatican and England and Spain were backing the North, and, and back the industrial area of the North. That's why they brought in all their Irish Catholic drunkards from Ireland, after the Jesuits caused the Great Famine in Ireland by sending out eight freighters a day out of uh, Irish ports loaded with meats and vegetables and so on because the Jesuits controlled Queen Victoria and British MI5 and the British secret intelligence. So they deliberately starved the southern Catholics of Ireland, where the majority of them died, to drive them to America to enlist in the northern army. And they were the drunken bummers that went down to the south and raped, pillaged, and plundered the southern Protestant people with the blessing of the Vatican. Um, then they put the south under martial law for two years until those states, by force, under threat of a bayonet, would ratify the 14th Amendment. And so the 14th Amendment is passed under threat, duress, and coercion. In law, nothing is binding on you if, it's, if, if you're down with a knife to your throat and you consent to it. So if, it's, if that's the way it is for an individual, why isn't it that the way with the state? Why should any, any of the southern states be compelled to be under the 14th Amendment when they were forcibly put under a bayonet under martial law, uh, div divided into five regions in the South under five Union generals, one of them being General Sheridan, a Roman Catholic. And then you had Butler the Beast in New Orleans, and you had uh, Sherman, and you, just a bunch of savage northern generals treating the southern people despicably, uh, deriding them over slavery when the vast majority of southern slaves were treated well by their masters, unlike the slaves in, in uh, the West Indies. Uh, so... <clears throat> They, they uh, put the South under martial law till they consented at the point of a bayonet to ratify. And then uh, when that happened, it changed the origin and character of citizenship, and therefore we have a whole new country. The deception is they kept the name of their new country the same name as the old country. They should have called it the American Empire rather than the American Republic because the Jesuits corrupted our republic just as the devil had done with the Roman Republic and converted it to an empire under Augustus. So what was once a limited republic in Rome now becomes an empire. And with an empire, nobody has any absolute rights. And the purpose of an empire is twofold. To go to war and to pay a tax. As long as you go to war and you fight the wars of the Caesar, you fight the Crusades for the Pope, and you pay the Pope's income tax, even though if you're in the private sector you don't owe it, you're okay, you're a patriot, you're a great guy. But the moment you stop refusing to fight the Pope's crusades, the moment you stop refusing to pay the Pope's crusade tax, which is an income tax, which is exactly how the papacy financed the crusades in the dark ages, they financed it with an income tax, and I have it quoted in my book, the moment you stop doing that, you're a terrorist, you're a criminal, you deserve to go to prison, you're worse than a murderer. Because you see, what you do is you threaten the very foundation of the Pope's design for this empire in restoring his temporal power around the world while at the same time building the nations that he wants to have built. Communist China, Communist Russia, the Pope's revived Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, which I believe the racial Jewish people have a right to that land, but not under this government ruled by the Pope. I'm for their right to live in the land, but I'm against the government that rules them because the government persecutes those people in Israel. It persecutes the Jewish people. They keep the agitation going. They never end it when it could easily be ended. So they use us 
to finance the Arab world, to finance Africa, to finance South America, to finance Mexico, to finance every other country but our own. We cannot build a true free uh, nation here. Uh, we can't have really an empire, and I wouldn't mind a, an American empire from, uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast if it was a republic, if it was a confederation of sovereign states, where Washington was not in your life. Like it used to be, not in your life. Because we have all the highest technology in the world. We have freedom of conscience when it comes to science. When freedom of conscience is applied to science, we invent light. We invent electricity. We invent um, uh, anti-gravity. We, we invent all the electromagnetic uh, science. It's all here. And anybody else who invents it, like in Germany, for example, is because they have a limited amount of freedom that they inherited from their Protestant Reformation in Prussia. But there are no Roman Catholic nations excelling in inventions and f because they have no freedom of conscience. They've been hammered down by the priests. It's not that they're stupid. It's just they're, they're totally kept down by the damnable religion of Romanism, which forbids any freedom of thought in the area of the Bible, of what you believe about God, and therefore that extends over to invention. How can you invent new wonderful things and products and ways to do business if you don't have the freedom to do so? That freedom arose from the Reformation, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. So, <clears throat> we are not allowed to build a nation. There is no reason, for example, that we should be subject to foreign oil. That is a sin and a crime. There is no reason why we should have a huge power grid in this country. That is a sin and a crime. The, the Dark Ages was broken, was formally broken with the Protestant victory um, in the first Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. And uh, with that victory in 1648, uh, modern historians will tell you that the modern era began. And that was the formal end of the Dark Ages. Ten million people died in the Thirty Years' War. It was a war of annihilation against the German Protestant people. Well, in World War II, Dresden was uh, the coup de grace, the, the, the finalization of the destruction. World War II, the second Thirty Years' War from 1914 to 1945, was the final destruction of the Reformation in Germany. It's been destroyed. Prussia ceased to exist as a nation in 1946. And the foundation for that judgment and session of that Protestant nation was because it was taken over and infested by high-level Freemasonry, beginning with Frederick the Great of Prussia. It should never have allowed it, and that's why I advocate the shutting down of every Masonic Lodge in this country. Every one of them, I don't care what they're, what they're affiliated with, how many good deeds they do, they're an engine of destruction for Protestantism, because it's Luciferian, it's Babylonian, it's religion, it's Egyptian, and it's religion, exactly as the Jesuits are, who wrote all the rites. That's what, uh, that's what we need to do to restore our country. So we're going back to the Dark Ages, which is exactly what R.W. Thompson said. He was a secretary of the American Navy in the 1870s, I believe, and he wrote the only, the only history of the Jesuit order, apart from mine, in 1894 called The Footprints of the Jesuits. And in The Footprints of the Jesuits, he tells you very many times over that the Jesuits seek to restore the Dark Ages. And therefore, they are, they are the devoted and implacable enemies 
of Protestantism and therefore of this once Protestant Republic. So we are going, the New Age movement is Teilhard de Chardin's clandestine movement to the Dark Ages. Because all, because all we want to do is pull people away from reading the Bible. If they don't read the Bible, they will believe anything. Because they have no absolutes anymore. And that's what we want as Jesuits. We don't care if they're atheists. We don't care if they're Buddhists. We don't care if they're whatever Tom Cruise is. What's that? Uh, Scientologists. Scientologist. We want them in anything and in everything except the AV 1611 Reformation Bible because this is called an ASP by the Jesuits. It bites us. It stings us. And we have to grab it like a, like a serpent and turn it into a rod, as Moses did, so that it has no effect anymore on the population. And once it has no effect on the pulpits and the population, our quest for universal political power will be complete. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to have theosophy in the 1800s. And the modern day equivalent of that is the New Age movement of which Teilhard de Chardin was the father of, and he was, according to my friend Christopher Strump, he was in the Office of Naval Intelligence while he was in China, uh, bringing about his fraudulent hoax of the Peking man. And then he was also later involved in the Central Intelligence Agency, this Jesuit. So anything they can do to tear us away from the Bible, and, and most assuredly, you have to get the Bible out of the public school. This abomination cannot be read there. After all, we have to have separation of church and state. By the way, Jefferson never met the separation of the Bible from culture. He meant what his Baptist overseers meant. You were not going to have an organized church operation uh, united with this government in Washington. That's what they meant. Which the Church of England, Jesuits taken over, uh, the papacy, which the Jesuits had taken over. They knew if you have a centralized <clears throat> religion united with a state, the Jesuits are going to run it. So no way. They put in the First Amendment, which is a Baptist document. The Bill of Rights is a Baptist document written by a Baptist, James Madison, who was not a Mason, at the behest of the Baptist preacher of Virginia, John Leland. Without Leland and the Baptists of Virginia, there would be no Bill of Rights. And the Baptists of Rhode Island. So, we're going back to the Dark Ages, that is correct. They were called the bummers. the bummers. They were called bummers because they went and they pillaged all the plantations, cut down the drapes, raped the women, incited the... Well, the blacks, they had, a, they had a loving relationship with their masters, so the blacks were against these bummers. They hated these Yankees. And the blacks would even take their little girls and hide them in the swamps from the, from the white Irish Catholic bummers so they wouldn't be gang raped by the northern army. And the Northern Army engaged in lots of gang rape on the black women and their daughters. And so the black Southerners hated the Yankees, and they wanted nothing to do with them. That's one of their major fear tactics. When you, when you uh, ravage and insult the womanhood of the people you're attacking, that greatly demoralizes them, because they will do anything to prevent that from happening. They will surrender, surrender their guns, whatever. They will really stop resisting. That's why you have the rising of the Klan shortly after the Civil War because those white Southerners down there to the man joined it because they were going to totally destroy Southern culture and the Yankees in the North, controlled by the Jesuits, 
were attending, attempting to incite a civil, a, 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 a race war where the blacks would rise up and kill all the whites as they did in Haiti uh, about oh, 80 years before that. But because the blacks were well treated and they were loved by their masters, they didn't do it. That's one of the greatest proofs that the white people of the South, particularly the Protestant states of Virginia, North and South Carolina, and Georgia, how they treated their servants well. It was black slaves that dug the trenches around Savannah and Atlanta to keep the Yankees from coming in. And when they fought to the bitter bloody end, it, they didn't do it because they had to. They did it because they wanted to. There was 38,000 black slaves fighting on the side of the South as soldiers. Because they knew these Yankees, when they were coming down, that they were going to pillage the place. And they did. So, the, the, uh, that was a war of annihilation. It was intended to destroy the white Protestant southern people. The Vatican could not stand the thought that there were white Protestants who, who were benefiting from slaves. Now we have to remember that the institution of slavery is not condemned in the Bible. We are constantly lambasted with this propaganda that slavery is a sin. Slavery is not a sin. There are people that are fitted for to servitude and there are a lot of white people fitted for servitude. Mm -hmm. And when the government seeks to prevent that natural um, incident from happening, it has to implement socialism. And this is what the Jesuits want. Universal socialism means the destruction of the middle class. The destruction of the middle class means the enthroning of the nobles because the nobles aren't paying income tax. They know how to get around it because they wrote the laws. So the purpose of the IRS is to enthrone the corporations, the, the, the cartel capitalist corporations, and to destroy the white Anglo-Saxon uh, Catholic and Protestant middle class because the white Catholics have benefited under this American form of government. And therefore the Vatican does not consider them true Catholics. So they're on the hit list, and that's why the Vatican is busy forcing miscegenation down the throats of not only white Protestants, but white Catholics too. Because you have to do away with the white race. Once the white race is neutralized to force miscegenation, then you can never have another Reformation, because no black nation was ever used to bring about the Protestant Reformation. The greatest servants in the world are white of the Lord. The white, the white man wrote all your systematic theologies. Look at Rid Past History. Look at Encyclopedia Britannica. Look at uh, all, your, all your lexicons, your, the Greek New Testament. Who put that together? White men. It's a white man's language. White men did it. God used the superior race to bring about the Reformation. To whom much was given, much was required. Not like I have something to boast because I'm white. I have a superior responsibility. I have a superior responsibility to resist tyranny because the greatest workers of iniquity are white. The black pope is white. All the papal, all the papacy is white. They have token blacks there that are cardinals, but they're just token. The wicked, the most wicked white men in the world, wicked men in the world are white. Therefore, <clears throat> this is a war between white men. Righteous white men versus wicked white men. And the blacks can either side with us, submit to us and help us, or they will side with the, our oppressors as they are now. Yes, um, I have been called a, a racist. Now, I'd like to define the term. There is such a thing as a hateful racist. This is what we're all familiar with. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan, first coming to mind. Um, the Nazis, next coming to mind. But we forget about the nation of Islam. See, those are black hateful racists. 
and they don't get any bad press for the most part. The new Black Panther Party, they're hateful racists. Okay. But hateful racism always springs from an injustice done to that race by the race that they hate. Okay? So you have the Ku Klux Klan arising as a result of the Yankees, of the Northern Yankees coming down and inciting the blacks to commit rape and murder to many thousands of white women. Well, the Ku Klux, so the, so the white men of the South say, we're not putting up with this. We're going after these carpetbaggers, our southern traders. We're going after these Yankees. And we're going after these savage blacks that are raping our women. And I would have been in the first Ku Klux Klan. The first Ku Klux Klan started in 1866, and it ended in 1869. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a nominal Mason, but he was not a practicing Mason just like George Washington. George Washington was not a practicing Freemason. He entered the lodge once or twice during the last 30 years of his life. Nathan Bedford Forrest was the greatest cavalryman of the Southern Confederacy, and he refused to watch the South be plundered by the Yankees and his, and his white people forcefully miscegenated with the blacks. So that's why you have the first Ku Klux Klan. It was dissolved in 1869 because Nathan Bedford Forrest said it was too violent. And so he formally did away with it. Well, who picks up? Albert Pike. That, that filthy, rotten, Luciferian Protestant murderer. Remember, he used the Sioux Indians to kill, what, 800 or so Lutheran Protestants up in Minnesota. He um, was convicted for treason, but was pardoned by President Johnson. Uh, Albert Pike should have been put to death. And yet, pardon me, it's this very Albert Pike who has a statue in Washington, D.C., in black Washington, D.C., where Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, those Freemasons, are not picketing the place and saying, let's get rid of this statue of Albert Pike in Washington, D.C. They oughta. I'd go right down there with them. Perhaps let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of it now. But that abomination is down there in Washington, D.C., he was a hater of black men. He was, the, he was the most powerful Freemason of the 19th century in America. And he can do no wrong because no one's going to go after his filthy name. So, that's your, that's your original Ku Klux Klan. Well, then the Ku Klux Klan is revived in 1915. And why is it revived in 1915? Because the blacks of the South are attempting to be used by the Jesuits in the North to vote against the white people of the South. So they're trying to use the blacks against the whites of the South, and this is creating a racial conflict. That's what's coming in the future. What should have been done was this. And see, Lincoln said himself that the, the, the white people and black people suffer when they live together. He wrote this in 1863. I have the quote. I have Jefferson's quote right here that says that uh, the white people and black people cannot live under the same government if they're equally free. They can't do it. And I have it quoted from there. That's the second section of the... Uh, of what was supposedly written on the um, Statue of Liberty. And I use this quote a lot, and I have it in my, um, in my uh, series, Averting the Race War. You may have heard that. But on page 62, <clears throat> this, is what, um, this is what Carlton Putnam writes in his view, Race and Reason, a Yankee view. And this was the president of Delta Airlines. And it was published in 1961, and here's what he writes on page 62. 
On a marble panel in the Jefferson Memorial in Washington is a fragment of one of Jefferson's sentences. As inscribed on the panel, the words are, quote, Nothing is more certainly written in the book of fate than that these people, the Negroes, are to be free, unquote. As written by Jefferson, there was no period after these words. There was a semicolon, and the sentence continued, quote, nor is it less certain that the two races, equally free, cannot live under the same government. That was omitted, because the purpose of the Jesuits is to formally and forcefully amalgamate this country so as to bastardize and mongrelize the white race, so that the white race will never rise up again in revolt against the power of the Jesuit order. A mulattoized, mongrelized race cannot do it. They have never done it in history. And the Jesuits know this because we have the curse of Canaan coming into place. Now I realize this is, not a, this is not a popular subject, but it's the truth. Canaan was cursed by Noah. Canaan was Noah's grandson. He didn't directly curse his son Ham, so he cursed Canaan. And that curse was that Canaan would be a servant of servants to his brethren. that Japheth would dwell in the tents of Shem, that Sh the, uh, Shem would be widespreading, <clears throat> but that uh, Canaan would be the servant of Shem and Japheth. Well, the Shemites are the Middle Eastern peoples and the Oriental peoples. The Japhethites are the whites. You will not find in history where white people have been subordinated to blacks in any culture or in any civilization. It does not exist. I challenge anybody to show me history where there existed a nation, including Egypt, where blacks ruled over whites. So their whole design is to forcefully race mix the country. And if you don't race mix, they're going to tag you with the labels, you're racist and prejudiced. And so I respond by saying I am not a hateful racist, which gives, brings us to our second definition. As I said, there is a hateful racism that is the product of evil acts done to the, uh, an individual race by another race that births hateful racism. Uh, for example, uh, Malcolm X, I believe his grandmother had been raped by a white man and his father had been killed by the Ku Klux Klan. So I understand his hatred for the white man I, it's, it's not right, but I understand it. Okay. And so that they made him, they fitted him for what he later became. But some of the things that Malcolm X advocated in the Nation of Islam were correct. Black nationalism is correct, just like white nationalism is correct. Black separation of white people is correct, just like white separation from black people is correct. Because that's how God intended it. That's why he created the races in the first place. To keep mankind separate. Whenever we look out at an audience and see the different races sitting out there, the first thing we should think of is the judgment of God. The reason why there's not one race, one language on one landmass is because God created those things to keep mankind separate. Because in a short 1656 years from Adam to, to Noah, you have the entire human race on one landmass speaking one language, it was one race, whatever it was. It wasn't white and it wasn't black. 
but whatever that race was, they're all united against God and all their high technology and everything. So to prevent that from happening, or to at least slow it down, the Lord instituted the races with Shem, Ham, and Japheth. He instituted the languages of the Tower of Babel. And then he instituted the continents in Genesis 10.25, in the days of Peleg was the earth divided. And that's why if you look at any map, you see the continents fit together. And, and hateful racism is a wonderful tool of the Jesuit order. Because out of hateful racism, you get things like the Tuskegee experiments by injecting syphilis into black men. So, uh, when you have hateful racism, you have those kinds of things done. Or you have things done like a certain black panther put a shotgun up a white woman's vagina and pulled the trigger. And now you see all this black on white crime. It's everywhere. All you need to do is turn on cops or turn on a program before that, the vast majority of it is black on white crime. This is exactly what the Jesuits want. They want it. And they use their white Freemasons in the courts to not punish it. So you have the hateful racism which the Jesuits capitalize on. They justify more police. They justify more prisons. They justify doing away with rights like gun rights. So we're going to gun run guns in the black communities cause the gangs to fight and kill each other off the bloods and the crips and then we'll use that as a justification to take the guns away from everybody including all the white people that's, right. that's what they're doing so they love black on white crime they promote it they use their Louis Farrakhan they, they use their Al Sharpton and a lady called me from a black lady called me from Chicago who is a radio show host and she told me Louis Far uh, Al Sharpton has been an FBI informant for years not to mention the fact he's a Mason. So these black Freemasons, most of the mulattoes, because the mulattoes always betray their own race, the black race, into the hands of evil white men. So the Jesuits, they want mulattoism because the mulattoes will work against their own black race, those who are truly black, in favor of the white man who runs them. And an, an exception to this was Malcolm X, but, but uh, you have Barack Obama, who's an example of this. You have uh, H. Rapp Brown, who's an example of this. You have Huey Newton, who was an example of this. You have Angela Davis, who is an example of this. All the key, uh, Julian Bond, who is the head of the, um, uh, the NAACP, all of them are mulattoes. They're the Pope's mulattoes. And what they're advocating is what? They're advocating more integration. More universal equality. It can't happen. So therefore the federal government needs to further tax the white man, steal money from him, to pour it down a sieve called socialism and an affirmative action and more welfare and SSI when it just builds more and more huge savage black communities because when you give money to a person it makes them irresponsible. There's more black illegitimacy now than there ever was during slavery, than there ever was prior to the civil rights movement. I have a black friend of mine, he's an older man, he said we were much better off when we had segregation. He said we had our own black schools, we had our own black communities, we were much better off morally, we had much less uh, illegitimacy. Now with all this money given to all the blacks and forced miscegenation and integration, they have 70% of their children are illegitimate. That's just what the Jesuits want. Because now you have all these illegitimate young boys, they don't have a father figure at home that's going to whip them when they're disobedient. Like I whip mine. And so they're wild. And they grow up wild. And now they're perfect to be used for criminals so that they can commit crime, justify more martial law, send them to the prisons. In prisons, they can be recruited into the Nation of Islam in preparation for the race war. those boys without a father and then step in and be that father which is these older gang gang, gang leaders, leaders. To that's bring right them into that family and that's right bring them that unity and bring them the brotherhood that's right they want to have a brotherhood and you also find the same thing in white catholic countries the white catholic countries produce the mafia 
the Italian Mafia. You have all kinds of illegitimacy in Italian Catholic country, in the country of Italy. I have a book here called American Politics, written in 1850 or so, showed that in white Austria, white Roman Catholic Austria in the 1850s had a higher illegitimacy birth rate than the black slaves of the South. Because the black slaves of the South were under the preaching of the Bible. They had their own churches. So, what you have is you have <clears throat> now this illegitimacy which the Jesuits love due to socialism, socialist insecurity, um, illegitimacy. Even Reggie White, the, that great football player for the Green Bay Packers, said S uh, integration destroyed the black community. He's absolutely right. So this is where a cult leader like Louis Farrakhan gets members when he advocates right things like the separation of the black race from the white race, no interracial marriage, that we need our own businesses, etc., etc., and he calls it a nation. He's right. The blacks in this country are a nation. I would hope that they would not be Muslim, because no black man in his right mind would be a Muslim. Because Islam and Romanism are, is, is the heart of the African slave trade. And if you do not believe me, read Blake's book, The History of Slavery and the Slave Trade, written in 1860. And I am highlighting it in my series, uh, averting the, How to Avert the Race War. That's on um, www.av1611 reformation.com That's where you can download that. We have some 34 sessions of 40 minutes apiece. So we have hateful racism. Now we need to deal with biblical racism. And biblical racism has to do with a man preferring his own race, seeking to build his own race, seeking to build his own country that's composed of, a, composed of a race, a specific language, a specific history upon which a specific culture is built. For example, when I, if and when I ever decide to go to Mexico, I would go to Mexico and I want to see Mexican people. I don't want to see white people. I want to hear them speak Spanish. I don't want to hear them speak English. I want to see them in their Mexican, the Mexican women in their beautiful Mexican dresses. They're long and they have these beautiful white blouses. I want to see the men in the Mexican wedding shirts with those long, beautiful, sagging shirts that the sword, that the duelers would use. See, they, they have a, I, I want to eat tacos. I want to eat Mexican food. I want to have a guacamole sauce and things like that. I, I want to go to Mexico and I want to go into a nation that has nothing to do with mine, racially, linguistically, culturally, or historically. I want to encourage that nation to keep their identity. So therefore, I say, no foreign land sales. All the companies in your country need to be Mexican-owned. Uh, the Mexican people benefit from the profits. Mexico is full of gold. It's full of silver. It's full of oil. It's a nice place for a tourist to go because it has a beautiful climate. Mexico could be a wealthy country, but why it is broken is because of the papacy, because of the Vatican, because the Archbishop of Mexico is the lord and master of the whole country. And because he's brought in American cartel capitalist corporations run by the Pope to take all of its natural resources. It's ruined Mexico. That's why we have an alien invasion of Mexican Roman Catholics. They've wrecked it. It's a gang war. It's a dope haven, all because of the Vatican's Central Intelligence Agency, Mafia, 
working with the Mexican families in Mexico, and that's what they've done to their own people. They've destroyed any possibility of a middle class, and only the nobles rule, and everybody else is to be shorn and eaten by these criminals. Knights of Malta, high-level Freemasons of, of America and other nations working for the papacy. So when I go to Mexico, I want to be Mexican. I want to see them. And then when I, then when I want to leave, I want to go back to my country. That's white. We speak English. Um, we have organic hamburgers on wheat bread. We have Celtic sea salt. We don't have any of the junk food. In other words, my new white nation, all the junk food's gone. We don't have any of the, the, the rotten ice cream made from plaster of Paris, and we don't have Morton salt. We don't have the Jesuit order sugar cane, sugar processing. That's why I refuse to eat sugar. I refuse to eat CNA sugar or any of the other processed sugar, number one, because it's poison. You might as well eat heroin. And number two, that the slave trade was, was <clears throat> prosecuted, was, was carried out under the guise of providing the black slaves from Africa to the sugarcane fields in the West Indies. So slavery brought the curse of white sugar on the white people of the world. So I refuse to eat white sugar because that's, that uh, enhances or gives a blessing upon the African slave trade that was run by the Pope and Islam. Even though England was involved in the African, Royal African Company, the Royal African Company of England, run by Charles II and his brother James II, was completely in the hands of the Jesuits. And they had a monopoly on the slave trade at that time. So, Sir John Hawkins is not the father of the slave trade. All these blacks are telling us it's Sir John Hawkins. It's not Sir John Hawkins. It is Antonio Gonzalez of 1434 of Portugal, who's the father of the slave trade. So it's the Catholic nations of Spain and Portugal that first started it, and then Islam, and then the English Protestants later joined it in the late 1500s. But you see, the Jesuits blame only white Protestants for the slave trade. So they, so they can keep their hands clean and so that their white Roman Catholic countries won't, won't suffer. Who are the countries demanding to have reparations paid? White England? White America? But what about reparations from Spain? What about reparations from Portugal? What about reparations from Egypt and Turkey? Because the slave trade, those black slaves were rounded up by Muhammad Ali, that was, that's what his name in the 1800s, Muhammad Ali, the Sultan of Egypt, the most powerful slave trader of his day in, in the Islamic world, he rounds up these blacks and he brings them up to Cairo and Constantinople and sells them in the markets. So John Newton, Wilberforce, in conjunction with Granville Sharp. Granville Sharp is, was a Greek master. He wrote a, it's called Granville Sharp's Rule in Greek grammar. Granville Sharp was learned law so that he could... <clears throat> so that he could be a part of doing away with the slave trade. And it was Granville Sharp that was responsible for the Somerset case in what, 1772 that declared that any black man put a foot in England, he was automatically free. All of it Protestant, all of it Bible-believing. The doing away with the African slave trade and the gradual emancipation of the blacks, setting up Liberia in this country. We bought the land from the Africans. Our Protest my Protestant forebears bought the land from the Africans set up the Liberian colony, was beginning to repatriate the black Americans back to Liberia. They were prospering. They were reading the Bible. They had a huge production of fruits and vegetables. They were given warships by Germany, by Protestant Prussia, by America and England. We white Protestant nations were helping the Africans to reestablish themselves in Africa. But never is it spoken of. Only reparations. Well, I've, I've got the answer. Here's the final reparation. We're going to obey the Word of God, and we're going to separate. You have your nation somewhere here in North America. We have ours. We can engage in commerce and trade if we wish. If we don't wish, then that's our business. And that would be the final settlement of this problem. But never will the Jesuits allow this as long as they run the country. So 
we have all this hateful racism on the part of the blacks, on the part of the whites, fomenting race war to justify fascism and martial law. Then we have biblical racism, which says, I don't hate your race, I love my race. And so for that reason, I live in a white community. I have a right to live in a community where there are only white people. I have a right to have a business where there are only white people working for me. That is, if I can find some that are responsible these today anymore. Um, I, have, I want to have a church where it's only white people. I want to have a white culture where we speak English. We don't have two languages. I want what we once had. So, I advocate the creation of a new white nation somewhere here in North America. And we need to start migrating there now. Because you can't have a, mi a nation until you first have a migration. The problem with migration is we have a filthy federal government that says it's against the law for you white boy to set up a white community. That's illegal. So they have forbidden any possibility of a white migration where we can be white to the end that we would set up a new nation because they made that illegal in this country. So that shows you the criminality of Washington and the Jesuits who run it. So God will have to get involved. But the point is that the, the Christian men should prefer their own race. If I was a black Christian, I would prefer my own race. I would want to live around my own people in a place other than a ghetto. If I was a Mexican, I would want to live around my own people. If I was an Arab, I want to live around my own Arab people. If I'm a Jew, I want to live around my own Jewish people. That's why you have Jewish communities in this country. And by the way, the Jews have never fared so well in their diaspora as they have in white Protestant nations. But the Pope's court Jews, excuse me, are doing their best to destroy white Protestant nations to the detriment of their own racial brethren. And that's what's happening here. That's what happened in Germany. That's what's happening in England. So, a biblical racist is one who prefers his own race, language, and culture, wants to live around his own people, doesn't hate any other race, is not designing to go conquer another race, is not designing to go conquer another nation. Our historic white Protestants purchased what we got here. Pennsylvania, every square foot of Pennsylvania was purchased from the native Indians here, from the savage native Indians. We didn't steal one square foot. It was historically Protestant with, you know, William Penn. So I want a white Protestant nation once again where we have our legitimate boundaries, where we can serve the Lord in a written Bible, and people who wish to visit us can visit, but they can't live here, and they can't race mix with us because we are going to honor the boundaries, the borders, the divisions that God has established. God hates unity. God wants divisions when it comes to sinful mankind. In heaven, when we don't have a sin nature, why, of course it will be interracial mixing because we have no sin nature. But we will maintain our racial identity, we will maintain our linguistic identity, we will maintain our cultural identity. There's an American over there. There's a white American. There's a black American over there. There's an African over there. There's a South African there. And that will be delightful because I believe we will all speak our native languages, but yet we'll understand all languages. So we're going to maintain that difference. And if you read Revelation 20, you see the nations in eternity. Or Revelation 21, one of the two. We have Revelation 5, 9. Those that have redeemed out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Those distinctions remain to the glory of God. I would hate to think that heaven is composed of one race, one language, and one culture. So, um, we have a biblical race. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sent only to the house of the lost sheep of Israel. Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Go not into the way of the Samaritans, half-Jews. Go only to the house of the lost sheep of Israel. He only has a Jewish, racial, Hebrew-Jewish-Israelitish mission. Even though he talks to the Gent Samaritan woman at the well, this is a, what's coming, but it was not his mission. When Israel rejected him and he was killed, buried and resurrected, then the gospel goes to all nations. But not prior to that. Only Israel. So he preferred his own people. He preferred his own race, language, and culture. He didn't hate Gentiles. He preferred not to be around them, and he preferred not to talk to them. He preferred not to talk to the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15. He wouldn't talk to her to begin with. 
then, old woman. But even the dog, it's not good to give the children's bread to the dogs, you pet dogs. He regarded non-Jews as pet dogs. He said, she said, but even the dogs eat of the crumbs of the master's table. She says, old woman, great is thy faith, be it unto you, according to you, as you will. And her daughter was made whole. But he was not sent to talk to Gentiles when he departed to the coast of Tyre and Sidon. He departed for rest. He didn't depart to minister. Christ never went to Africa. He never went to America. He only was sent to the house of the lost sheep of Israel for the duration of his ministry. So, he preferred his own race, language, and culture. Even so should we. And when we do that, we have respect for other races. We punish our own racial kindred for afflicting other races. We will not tolerate it. If there is a white nation that we know that's persecuting a, uh, an oriental nation, like America bombing Vietnam, then we will say we will have no trade with you, nothing to do with you, until you stop persecuting this oriental nation or this black African nation. And so we don't partake of other nations' sins. We keep aloof from that. We still trade, we still do business, but we are not going to persecute or interfere with the domestic tranquility of that people. But let's just say, well, the blacks need to be brought up to our, our standard of living in Africa. Says who? If they want to live in tribes, that's their business. How they want to live in their own nation is their business. So we have to acknowledge that. And so a non-hateful biblical racist acknowledges the racial differences, doesn't hate any other race seeks the benefit of his race. And when he benefits his race, he will produce things that will benefit other races. And that's how it should work. We should have a united, a, 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 an embassy of united sovereign nations where we all get together as sovereign peoples and we are there to oversee that these other nations are not afflicted or persecuted and just let them develop how they wish to develop. Totally. Because that would go right against Satan's government. Satan's government. See, for the devil to implement his new world order under the Pope, on the final risen Pope that will be murdered, come back to life, and be the Antichrist in Jerusalem, for that to happen, you have to race mix everybody. You have to culture mix everybody. So you have to bring people of other nations into your country. So you have no longer a common race, a common history, a common culture, or a common language. And then, when you have this, then you can foment wars and agitations and crime, race on race crimes, nation on nation crimes. The, the, the Irish can persecute the Italians, etc. And when you have that, that's what we want, because now we can justify more law, more prisons, more police, and that's what we want. We want a disarmed, homogenated population that, that is completely without any foundation or bearing in its past and then we can control them by fear and get them to fight our wars and work for us in our corporations and make sure they reproduce, show them plenty of pornography so that will stimulate them to fornication and adultery so they can produce their replacements that will have no fathers or mothers. We're going to run plenty of crack cocaine into their new neighborhoods so we can destroy all the black mothers, so we can get those little black boys and we can make them into killers and savages and gangs, which is exactly what we want. And show it on the news. And show it on the news. Show the white man out of their gun. Yeah, to, to, to con the white man out of his gun. The white Protestant. Because the white Roman Catholic has no boast as far as gun ownership is concerned. There's no white Roman Catholic nation in Europe that has the right to own a gun. And they've taken the rights from the Protestants away from England and Scotland and, and uh, Canada. And so that's the design. There has to be universal gun confiscation. And the great bulwark are historic white Protestant peoples who realize the importance of the sword of just defense, as Knox called it. That's why I advocate on my broadcast, every white man needs to get armed. Personal defense, uh, building your body, ca carrying weapons, learn how to use a knife and a gun, 
so that you can defend yourself and your family when you have to live in this forcefully race mixed culture mixed colony uh, culture until we can get our own nation.